morning, everyone, and you're very welcome uh, to this morning's uh, webinar on charity governance. My name is Tony Ward. Uh, I'm a chartered accountant, as indeed uh, many of you probably are. And um, I am the chair of the uh, Chartered Accountants Charity and Nonprofit Special Interest Group. And this morning's webinar is brought to you, as all the best uh, advertisements say, brought to you by our group and also the uh, Governance and Ethics Committee of Chartered Accountants Ireland. Uh, Theresa Campbell is chair of that committee and Theresa will close this morning's webinar. Um, to give you um, a brief uh, outline of the timing and the content, uh, we have a, a, a presentation by David Brady uh, shortly, uh, then a panel discussion led by Neil Fitzgerald, who is head of Governance and Ethics at Chartered Accountants Ireland. Uh, with um, Inez Bailey, uh, John Rycroft and Ash Ashling Fitzgerald as panellists. So Neil can introduce um, Inez, John and Ashling at that point. Uh, I want to thank Neil and his colleagues uh, in charge of the Accountants Ireland for organising, planning and organising today's event. I think it will be very um, useful and looking forward to it. To give you just a little uh, piece of, of my role or the role of my uh, the, the char charity and nonprofit uh, special interest group within Chartered Accountants Ireland. Um, we're not part of the, using the word governance, we're not part of the governance structure, but we are uh, uh, a network. And a shout out to anyone on the call today who might be interested, because I have a feeling that whereas many Chartered Accountants may not be actually employed in the sector, in the charity sector, an awful lot of us through our participation in committees or boards uh, are involved in charities. So I think it's probably an area um, that is, is very um, relevant to a lot of us. And we are very eager to have people participate in our special interest group. So if you're interested in contacting me, uh, please do so. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, the area of governance, I suppose, is close to our hearts. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't be here this morning. And I my sense of it is, uh, having worked in the charity sector for most of the last 10 years, it, an awful lot of organizations ha have been doing a very good job and have been trying to do a very good job, uh, but it's complex and uh, a lot of organizations for public benefit, which charities are, often are drawn to focus on their beneficiaries. And therefore, I suppose you can get a sense sometimes that people aren't sitting around the board table to do governance, but they're there to service the the, the beneficiaries and service users. But more and more, we have all come to realize how important governance is. If it's done well and seamlessly, it can actually be very straightforward. And certainly the charities regulator uh, bringing in their own code of governance for charities um, a couple of years ago has uh, in some ways upped the game, but also made it easier because you're now reporting to a defined uh, set of principles. So. That I think that's been very useful. Uh, so very important that we, we take time, as we are doing this morning, to focus on, on the area of charity governance. Um, I, initially, I'm now going to introduce you to David Brady. Uh, David has a presentation which will take about 20 minutes. Uh, we will flow on to the panel discussion then via Neil. And we, we do want to leave room for questions and answers. So you'll find that in your uh, tab on the webinar please do put your questions in there. We, we may get to uh, some of them, all of them, or we may not, but we'll, we'll definitely do our best. And we'll also do our best to keep things to time. So I'm, I'm now uh, giving Neil um, responsibility for keeping us to time so we uh, can be done and dusted by 12 noon. Um, so I'm gonna hand over to you, David. David Brady um, is a chartered accountant and he is the principal of uh, DB Consultants. Uh, a management consultant, uh, and David focuses on strategic planning, uh, executive development, and corporate governance. David uh, has also been on the uh, board of the Charities Regulator since 2014, so he comes possessing an awful lot of relevant uh, knowledge and experience when it comes to the governance of charities. So David, I'm going to hand over to you to commence your presentation. Um, uh, thank you, Tony. Um, uh, thank you for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, um, so uh, uh, my pleasure to be here this morning. Um, actually, uh, 
uh, my connection with Chartered Accountants Ireland dates back to when I was um, a chairperson of the group holding the same role as Tony, actually. So uh, uh, I remember very clearly the day when I got the good news that I was appointed to the board of the regulator. In fact, I was there in the office uh, side by side with Connor Woods, who was a, had just been appointed as chairman of the, uh, the first uh, board of the regulator. So uh, you're in good company, Tony. Um, so uh, I'm really pleased to, uh, to give this presentation this morning. I'm just waiting for my slides to kick in. Yeah, um, uh, so I've been working in the sector, the charity and social enterprise sector for um, the last 15 years as an accountant and um, also on the board of the regulator, although I'm not speaking in that capacity this morning, but more in my uh, work as a consultant to both the private sector and the charity sector. And I suppose that really informs um, my presentation today, because uh, what I have noticed, uh, particularly since the introduction of the governance code by the regulator, is a sense that momentum is building around the positive benefits of governance. Um, and that's, uh, I think, in good measure to the, the contribution which has been made by the introduction of the code. Um, I would say, however, that the code itself, um, I, I would regard somewhat as being a, the hygiene factor of governance in that it represents um, a pass-fail criteria only. So um, in my comments in, uh, and in the model that I have developed around uh, sort of the board maturity model, uh, I'm regarding uh, uh, compliance with the code as being sort of the first pass. And uh, the governance code itself reflects a series of principles of equal importance, whereas I, I, I feel that best practice doesn't necessarily mirror that. So the challenge is one of defining good to great and not for profits. Just before I get into the model itself, I think a question that I've noticed um, uh, many boards asking, a very valid question is, why are we a charity? Um, and I, the bad answer to that are really around necessity of funding and tax exemptions. Um, and I think that's not always the fault of the charity because they've been all, almost boxed in or is by necessity are required to become a charity to, to, to benefit from funding. But really it, it then becomes its own prisoner. Uh, and the, uh, the, I suppose the, the important reasons for being a charity are down at the bottom of that list around problem solving and particularly charitable purpose, which really should drive all um, appropriate charity activity. Um, and uh, another question is, well, how different then is a charity from a private organization? And to be a board member of a charity, how different is it? Well, just a, the comments in the introduction around it being a public body or public benefit body that was made by Tony are caught at the very heart of it. And I, and I think that it's important that, that's, that, that boards are, are reminded of that uh, as they go through their process of uh, evolution. Um, and that very quickly they realize too that so uh, a key factor is reputation management and stakeholder alliance. Um, because uh, as we have seen, a, a, an impact on reputation can impact directly on the top line and bottom line of the organization. So it's all connected. I will be returning to this theme of problem eradication mission because a key definition, it was a, I remember very clearly a discussion I had with somebody who was involved with the, the board of Focus Ireland some years back. And they made a comment to me that, well, really the purpose of Focus Ireland was not to, to build houses for the homeless. It was to actually to get rid of the problem of homelessness. And that stuck with me that that really is the purpose of charities. It's about problem eradication as much as uh, it is building the capability and size of a charity. So I'll just come on to the, uh, the board maturity model that I've developed. It's built around five themes and 16 questions. So um, I will uh, return to these um, themes and questions later on this morning. Um, so but just to introduce them briefly. So the themes are around strategic clarity and leadership, systems capability, problem solving skill set, monitoring adapt focus, and human performance system. Uh, just to to sort of signpost for the moment. 
But here's the model itself. So you'll see in the model that there are five maturity levels. And um, as I indicated, the lower levels are around the non-compliant. First of all, the first level is at the non-compliant board, moving up to the second level only, which is a compliant board, and the three higher levels of effective, progressive, and elite. So I realize there's quite a lot of information on these, uh, uh, on these slides. Um, I've uh, mentioned to, to Neil and the team that I'll be uh, supplying a copy for everybody attending afterwards. So don't worry if you, if you can't um, um, see or well, you know, uh, uh, digest the information at this point. But just quickly to talk about these different levels. So the non-compliant level um, suggests a, a negative attitude in the board towards governance, unaware of strategic developments, short-term funding focus, basic financial information, outdated policies, no risk register, an antagonistic relationship with staff, and a weak AGM process. So that's at the very lowest level of maturity. Moving up one, we have the compliant board, which um, embraces a much more tolerant, but not a necessarily a positive attitude towards governance. It's, it's more around getting the job done than it is say, seeing the positive benefits of good governance. Um, so close to developments other than self-beneficial. So it, the focus is really around the sustainability of the organization rather than any kind of problem eradication um, discussions and so forth. Uh, the policies would, would be current, there'd be a risk register, they would be largely in compliance with the code, if not fully compliant, um, but there would be superficial staff, superficial support to the staff, and the AGM would be limited to the board only, rather than having an exter external group of members. So moving up through the different levels, effective, progressive, and elite, I leave the, uh, the detail for you to, to look at, but if I was to just talk about the, the elite board or the superior uh, maturity level for a board. It's really around the board having delivered a series of strategic programs that have resulted in significant impact or funding. So they've got a track record built up about what they've actually achieved over their duration as board members. The board and staff have a collective problem solving mindset. So that's tremendous working together in harmony in the team and the board a series of both financial and non-financial KPIs, employ long-term resource planning, pr promote a risk management culture over and beyond risk registers, review strategy regularly, headhunt new team, uh, new chair and board members. So they're proactively looking for those senior board members and embrace occasional fail failure positively. So they have a, 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 a not only tolerant, but a positive attitude towards that as well. Drilling that down then into direct, a director competency model or director competency matrix, I've used the same headings. So you'll see out the, on the far left, the non-compliant director is unfamiliar with the sector and the trends, uh, brings no particular technical value add to the board, unfamiliar with governance frames works and operates largely in terms of a blame game as to who's at fault, either externally or internally in the organization. If we moved over to the progressive and elite director, uh, we see a much more um, uh, open-minded strategic thinker, ability to see the charity niche, niche and advantages, skilled in multiple core charity business domains, for ha having a track record of having served in previous governance and leadership roles and innovative. And that's a, a really a key thing in terms of relevant operational and strategic domains. And that's uh, taken one step further in the elite model. Just maybe like to, to just point out the, the final bullet point under elite sets a positive tone on the board with staff and externally in the sector. And that's a, a word I've heard referred to in many different uh, areas. This, the importance of tone on the board, particularly by the, uh, the chairperson and the other directors and uh, embodiment of values. So just make a few comments then around and the hallmarks of achievement towards elite and transitioning through the levels in terms of my experience. So the first comment I'd make is just that beginner status has little to do with, with length of tenure on the board. And I think we're familiar with that is how ingrained bad habits can uh, 
can cause a board to really act in a, a rather negative way towards governance. Uh, again, again, the code has, has, I think, positively improved that, but it is an issue that those who haven't had a, a, a rotation policy can, can suffer from just familiarity with them, um, with doing things in a certain way. But other, other positive signs about transition are tangible proof of, proof of elevation rests in the quality of data and controls. And a key aspect of that is the quality of financial and board information. And um, I hope that's uh, something that we can talk about uh, during the panel discussions. I've talked a bit already about the fulfillment of, of impact objectives as being a key uh, transition factor. Funders want collaborations, charities don't, at least the bad ones don't. At least the uh, the ones that are at the, the lower end of the scale don't, and that's again around uh, looking at problem eradication rather than self interest. But I, I suppose if there's one key aspect or one key feature I would take out from the elite boards, it's it's that innovation is is as essential in the charity sector as it is in the private sector, and um, we really see that modelled in best practice, um, not only externally in terms of what's uh, visible to donors, but internally. For example, um, Char uh, Charity Water in the UK took quite an innovative approach around how they got uh, high net worth individuals to uh, fund the administration of their charity so that 100% of donors' um, inputs would go directly to end users. That's the kind of innovative thinking which, uh, which can happen on elite boards. So hallmarks of advancement then. Um, so the, the, this is again looking at the, the far right of the scale. So a proactive emphasis on risk, risk appetite, supply chain, et cetera. So um, only last week um, I heard a presentation by Pat Smith, Director of Services in Tusla, talk about in their, how in their latest um, governance review, they began with thinking about risk appetite, realizing the, the strategic importance of deciding which areas of risk they would focus on and have zero tolerance, whereas there would be others with, with, with which they would have greater flexibility and room for advancement and change, realizing that those are areas that wouldn't be possible to have quite as, uh, as uh, high a level of focus on in terms of risk. Supply chain is obviously going to be an important issue with the uh, unfortunate events happening in Ukraine and elsewhere, COVID and so forth. Um, but other hallmarks of advancement are things like being data driven. And um, I've noticed particularly how with chairs, they're really starting to take advantage of the extensive information on the uh, regulator's register and guidance hub. And um, again, I laud the, the regulator for having a strategic aim around uh, providing additional information to the sector, which will be a benefit to high performing um, uh, boards and so forth. But, but attending charity event, uh, sorry, sector events, sectors pertaining to the, the charity and so forth, having agendas where there's information on the sector and innovation or other signs of elite boards. Uh, another a hallmark of advancement is translation of HR best practice from private sector to charity. And, and during my time actually working in the sector, I was uh, really impressed whenever um, I saw some, um, uh, one of the directors was a, uh, somebody from, um, uh, from Facebook actually, and they were able to um, bring tremendous value add in terms of understanding around pay scales, um, uh, well-being, resilience and so forth that were very advantageous to the charity. And I also I would um, point to the really progressive thinking around for taking place from the wheel, their Carmichael, um, our own institute, Charities Institute and so forth around accounts and governance awards, charities for, forums and opportunities for networks, to, uh, for chairs to network with other chairs. And this is something which, again, is a hallmark of the, um, the higher end charities. And uh, also to particularly mention the critical role which the, uh, the, the finance people play um, in all of this. So chartered accountants, um, as I'm so frequently reminded, play a critical role in terms of the um, progression of charity boards. And unfortunately, there's still a lack of skills in the sector um, around finances. I mean, even in the last few days, 
uh, without, um, uh, uh, you know, one of the senior administrative said, the administrator said to me, well, you know, I've never set a budget in my whole life in this place. And I thought, well, oh, I'm not sure if that's a great thing to say, but uh, it really pointed to the need for having um, chartered accountants uh, at, at board level to point out these things. And of course, it's mentioned in the code as well. Not to mention, not to forget too, the, the, the support, the risks related to hyperinflation, which could be coming along. Uh, uh, we were seeing that already and how that could impact on charities uh, and the importance of that. So just to say in your slides, you will get this information around the five themes. I'm afraid I, just to, uh, to Neil's point, I don't have time for those today. The, reds, the red uh, questions are the key questions and then the backup ones. So um, I encourage you to have a look at those in due course. So just uh, I'm going to conclude my presentation now. The recap on the most common problems, um, you know, you can read these for yourselves. And fortunately, I think we're all pretty aware of them at this stage around reluctance to evaluate and benchmark performance and measurement and operational decisions and so forth. Failure to see charges is different coming back to my earlier slides. Um, and uh, this key point of poor quality reports at board level and finances. Just a, a, some action steps for you to take away and think about. Be very happy for you to share the slides from today with your board. Um, you might like to pick out one of the five themes and discuss that. Uh, have a, you know, it might be useful to see how you, you, you fare around the, the five levels. Reach out to others in your sector through the various uh, forums that have been mentioned, uh, regulator events and so forth. Um, and then perhaps hold a, a meeting or a forum on elite board practices, perhaps at your next board appraisal and create a two-year plan around smart goals from all of the above. will be something for you to take away from that. And uh, I look forward to hearing the, the panelists' comments and uh, the, the discussion and so forth. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. That was excellent and very insightful. Uh, David, I can see you're off the hook so far. There is no questions in the chat or anything for you. I'm sure they're probably writing them out and they probably take a lot of words. So uh, <laughs> I'm sure they will, they will flow in later. That's great. Uh, Good morning. Thank you. In, in, in the meantime, I'm going to turn to, I better turn my camera on actually, so people just don't hear a voice mysteriously coming at them. I'm going to now turn to the panel discussion, if I may. And I'm delighted to be joined by a rather diverse panel who are going to offer us further insights based on David's presentation, but also on other governance issues facing the charities and, of course, the non-profit uh, sector in Ireland. So I'm delighted offering a non-executive perspective. We have John Roycroft joining us, and John is currently a trustee on the board of the National Advocacy Service for People with Disabilities, and he's also the chair of its Policy Communications and Governance Subcommittee. But John previously held senior positions in various different government departments and agencies, and was the program director for the Irish Refugee Protection Program in the Department of Justice and Equality. And John, you are very welcome. Offering the executive perspective, we have Inez Bailey, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the Centre of Effective Services. It's a non-profit, all-island organisation, much like Charter of Accountants Ireland. Inez was previously the Chief Executive Officer of the National Adult Literacy Agency, NANA, and I have some actually friends of mine that volunteer for that very worthwhile organisation, and she was CEO there for more than 20 years. And while Inez, Inez, I beg your pardon, was primarily providing an executive perspective, she is also a non-executive director with experience on a number of charity and public sector, for, sector boards. So Inez, you are very welcome and thank you for being here today. And last, but by no means least, we're delighted to be joined by Ashley Fitzgerald, no relation, offering the expert advisor perspective. Now, Ashley is a director with PwC and leads their not-for-profit assurance practice. Now, Ashley has worked with a wide range of clients across a number of sectors on accounting and assurance assignments, as well as governance and risk matters. And she is considered an expert on the charity SORC FRS 102 and your trust and trustee responsibilities. Now, Ashley is highly respected professional and also works with the charities regulator on a number of projects relating to the counting and reporting regulations. So thank you, Ashley, for joining us this morning.
So folks, if I if your cameras are on and microphones are on, I'm going to kick, get started. And after listening to David's presentation, I'm going to kick off with one burning question. So many charities, and just 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 for full declaration, I'm I'm involved in the charity sector myself. I have a day job with Charity Commons Ireland, but I also am a trustee on on a charity, and uh, I, I, hold, I hold various different positions. But um, many charities have worked hard, and some are still working hard to achieve full compliance with the Charities Governance Code. Now, the same could be said for non-profit organisations, because I'm also involved in a non-profit organisation that's not a charity. They don't have to comply with a charity's governance code, but they're working hard to comply with various different requirements, regulations, or funding conditions. So there's still a lot of effort there. From what I got from David's pr presentation, is complying with a code or any set of standards good enough to achieve good governance? And maybe I throw that one first to you, John. Thanks, Neil. Um, the answer is, in my view, is no, but it's an essential first step. If you're not compliant, you can't do much else. Looking at David's model, he started off with non-compliant and compliant, and he's three levels above that. In my view, your governance document has to be a living document. So at every single board meeting, some aspect of that, especially risk, needs to be considered. And once you get into this area, you will inevitably be drawn into other aspects of governance. So that invariably leads into the in Davis' model, the effective, the progressive, the elite level. Yeah, and, but I would say, get your compliance right first and then baby steps and go, you'll find you're inevitably drawn into a range of other areas, but it has to be a living document or it's useless. It has to be a living document. Inez, would you have a perspective? Yeah, I, I would always think of these standards and codes as you know useful guidance documents. They really usually have a minimum standard approach um, and organizations then can enter in and perhaps always take an evolving approach because essentially minimum standards are always going to change inevitably anyway. So they, they're not stagnant, they're stagnant for a period of time only, they'll be reviewed and they'll move on. So organizations themselves can take that approach to an evolving sense of um, both meeting those standards, but then surpassing them and getting into that idea, I think that we were, we were seeing in the presentation from David there of moving along that scale throughout a period of time. So, so they're a good starting point or a good platform to, to launch from. And, 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 and then, as John said, they are a living document. And Ashley, would you have a perspective on that? Yeah, Neil, I suppose, I suppose the same way, really, you know, a, 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 good, a very good starting point, but I suppose, you know, in summary, I suppose the answer to your question is probably no. Um, I suppose if you think of the code, you know, you, you can take the code as, as, as either a box ticking exercise or, you know, you can take it as, as, as something, you know, much, much different, I suppose, and much better in terms of how you improve your governance standards. Maybe just to give one example, I suppose, of if, if I think of the code itself, uh, there's, there's six key pillars. One of the pillars in the code is that whole area of exercise and control. And I suppose one of the core standards in that um, exercise and control pillar is, is the need to have an appropriate suite of financial controls in place to manage and, and account for your charity's money and assets. And I suppose this is one thing where you could be anywhere on the spectrum, uh, you know, uh, on David's spectrum there from non-compliant right, right up to elite. But I suppose if you think of it, the, the basic compliance charity there is going to have some sort of controls and procedures manual in place. And yes, that probably allows them to tick that box on the code. But I suppose to get yourself, you know, up the spectrum, um, you know, closer to the elite um, end of the spectrum, you need to be doing things like benchmarking, you know, your controls and procedures against other charities of your size and scale you could be doing things like asking either your external or your indeed your internal auditors if you have them you know to help you to do that by providing you with feedback on how your controls and procedures stack up when compared to other organizations that they deal with and i suppose you know doing that would bring you you know a step further or closer to, to good governance then i suppose simply taking the box to say yes we do have a good controls manual in place so interesting. So the, the actual code of compliance presents a common challenge that then leads or is an excuse for charities and not-for-profits to collaborate with each other on this common challenge. And from that process, then they're getting better insights or, or innovative ideas on, on how other people are doing things, therefore furthering uh, governance within their own organization. So that's that's good insights there. We have a living document. These codes are seen as a living document. They're a good starting platform, and they're also opportunities to actually collaborate and, and, and learn from others and what they're doing. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. Minimum uh, 
level of compliance is, is, is all the code is, a lot more is needed for good governance. John, if I may turn to you, please, because as a non-executive director, I am familiar with your background, and I'd like you to share some of that with, 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 with the audience here, because you, you have some interesting experience, you have practical experience of leading a rather significant project within a charity to implement a charity's governance code. Could you provide the audience here uh, with a very short overview of the process that you followed? And uh, just to keep it real, John, if perhaps I could ask you to focus on what you found most challenging and any unexpected benefits uh, that that project revealed for you. Okay, Neil, thanks. Thank you very much. Yes, in I suppose our benchmark that we obviously that was given to us was the the, gov the governance process to set down by the charities regulator. And we wanted to benchmark ourselves against that. So we set up a wor temporary working group of the board, uh, working with members of the executive of the charity. And we did something very simple. We simply took all the data that was in the uh, charities regulators governance code, all the requirements under the six pillars, and we put it in an Excel spreadsheet and we mapped ourselves to that. And interestingly, we saw immediately where we thought we had good practices, but the practices weren't well documented. They were more uh, practices that had evolved over a period of time. Or we found practices that got stuck at a point in time but hadn't evolved beyond that. So we found gaps and we documented all those gaps. We looked at all the documentation and rewrote it to comply and to make sure we were fully in compliance. And we shamelessly begged, borrowed and stole from everyone else's good practice. And the charity sector is wonderful in that it's very open and amenable to sharing their, their, work, their own good hard work. So I would say to anyone who's going to do this, um, there's a lot of great work out there. You don't have to reinvent the wheel, no pun intended, because um, the wheel is a great source of information in this area as well. And so we met over a period of about six months. We had about five meetings and a lot of work in between, and we got to where we felt we needed to be. One of the challenges I found was um, you can get lost in detail here, and there's no need to. The, one of the cha another challenge is to keep a focus on what's real and what's important. Because if you look at the governance code, you'll find crossover all the time between the different pillars. So you can get lost in detail. There's no need to do that. But one of the unexpected benefits was inevitably if you're going to do this and do it well you have to say how are we going to manage this into the future is this going to be something we put on the shelf and tick box or is this something that we're going to work through and make part of our routine board level organization level workings and that's what we did so we went into board succession planning um things like what do we need what are the ideal qualities of a director where are we where are the gaps we did board reviews all the, in, a very, in a very structured way. And where do we want to be in the future? How do we have our strategic plan represented on board agendas? How do we map what we're achieving in terms of outputs against our strategic plan so that we don't we look very busy, but are we achieving those goals that we set out to achieve? And you'll find that a good governance structure is the inevitable trampoline on which you progress as a charity or as an organization. So it, and if you do this correctly, inevitably it leads you on to the next levels so based on dave's template for example you will find that you're in one of the three levels above just compliance you might have a foot in this camp a foot in that camp but you can clearly see this is where we want to be and if you do that it makes the work at the charity at board level and sub board level actually easier because you have a very structured framework which is evolving within which you can conduct the business of the organization and the other thing it does, Neil, is it brings you to a great focus on risk. What is the organization's appetite for risk? How are you managing risk? And is that risk managed at the appropriate levels, both within the board and at the, uh, the executive level of the charity? And that's a critical factor because so many organizations are tripped up by an inability to manage risk or being unrealistic about risk. And we, everyone who's listening this morning knows the reputational disasters associated with a poor management of risk. So I would say they are some of the enormous benefits we've had in undertaking this process. And it's, it's not a frightening thing. The uh, material set out by the charity regulator is actually excellent. And I would highly recommend it as, as, a, as a starting point, even for charities that feel they're, they're well ahead in this game, benchmark themselves against the code. Yeah, thank you for that, John. And, and indeed, I can resonate a lot with what you said. I know in an organization I've been involved in, which is Age Action Ireland, I may as well come out and say it, um, I know when they, they put the Trojan effort into looking at compliance with the charities uh, code 
and actually caused him to actually look at policies and procedures that have been in place for quite a long time and um, look at rationalizing those and, and kind of considering what's a surfluous uh, and, and what's not necessary anymore. So it causes you to pause and, and consider what should we, do we need to stop doing as well as what do we need to start doing. Um, that process takes a bit longer because it, it, it goes back to the, the old saying as if I had time to write you a shorter letter, I would. So sometimes to rationalize your processes, it, you have to put in more effort. But uh, thankfully, there were some fantastic people around the board and around the table on the various committees in, in AD Act in Ireland that, that made that happen and made it happen in reality. And you mentioned the risk register there. I remember that being one of the mammoth tasks to undertake was the risk register was running to like, oh, 14, 15 pages. It's not like Age Action Ireland is a particularly risky organization, just that was the scale of the risk register. So it was scaling that back to something more manageable, something you could exercise greater oversight of, easier to read, therefore easier to spot issues and, 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 and highlight matters into a into kind of a two-page document. So it takes a lot of effort and, and it was only through compliance with the code it caused you to look at those. Um, Inez, John has offered us their non-executive perspective, but I'm very conscious that you hold an executive role and you've got to keep the show on the road, Inez, and you've got to ensure compliance and you've got to try and stay ahead or at least keep up with multiple stakeholder expectations, including those of your board. But what are the operational benefits from your perspective from having a good governance framework? Well, the first one I think is trust that um, comes from compliance with the code, with the code, not just in terms of the board itself having that trust in the entity, but also the staff um, and wider stakeholders. So I think it does bring um, an emphasis on the importance of trust. It's a way of demonstrating uh, a compliance with the standard that other people can understand because they may not be necessarily particularly au fait with the ins and outs of your individual organization. They will understand a standard that does apply for the whole sector. So I think it really does give that. Once people get into using, I think the code, it does start to become more of a flow in their work. And if we take the, the, the sort of the, the gradient effect that um, David shared with us, that becomes a flow and you become more and more effective, I think, in terms of using the, the, the various elements of the code for um, enhanced performance. And John has mentioned some of those areas. So as you did yourself, the risk register being a classic one where, you know, often these things are disproportionate to the size of the organization. They're either taken from the private sector um, and they're not necessarily appropriate. But we do need something but by using them and, and, and actually developing a competence within the organization to take on these facets, which wouldn't have perhaps been traditionally associated within the charity sector. You build up that competency, that fluency and that flow, and that actually starts to generate a greater performance capacity within an organization. So it goes from an organization that perhaps has um, a particular focus on delivery of a service, for example, into, I think, a wider sense of how can it be maybe innovative in terms of the future um, way that they might deliver that service, which mightn't have been the way they were thinking previously. In my own work, where I suppose we were dealing with a very complex social problem, th these are not things that can be solved in a short period of time. And that can be quite difficult, I think, for boards to hold in terms of getting um, feedback on effective performance or practice because it's not a service delivery and it's hard to get statistics, for example, on lobbying for policy change or something like that. Whereas I think the code brings in an assurance that actually you're checking all the time in terms of is this still the purpose of the organization? Has there been mission drift gone off into some other area perhaps for um, a, a quicker gain or indeed maybe for a particular funding reason? But in actual fact, the purpose of the organization was to stick at this perhaps more difficult, uh, nasty social problem that it's really trying to address. Um, but it gives the board confidence, I think, that it actually is contained within its mission. It's still doing what it's supposed to do, even when it can't necessarily see very obvious um, signs of, of achievement because some of these things do take quite a long time. And I think the final area I've mentioned is the integration of, of the idea of the governance code with other, both regulation and quality standards, which I think is really important. Again, in my own experience where we had 
met the, 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 the code um, governance standards, but we also went forward for accreditation under um, the qualifications and quality um, authority for the capacity to deliver accredited programs. So that in effect is another quality standard. Um, and there was huge overlap between the achievement of the governance code and indeed the requirements under regulation for accreditation and provision of programs. There's also, I think, a connection with just that overall quality approach to your work, that it does actually bring that focus of attention. So that moves it beyond a tick box, a tick box exercise, as I, as I mentioned earlier, to this evolving idea that you're actually building and enhancing quality. That connects, um, I think, to sometimes when there is a challenge in the organization, you'll find that organizations are actually better able to withstand those challenges. And um, so there is that sense that you can't avoid all challenges. There will be, there will be problems at some point. And organizations, I think, that have the code operating within them find those challenges. They're, they're better prepared for them and they're better able to withstand them and move beyond them. So I think in a, in a, in a kind of an all round sense, the code contributes to your overall performance as an organization um, from a number of levels, externally and internally. And it makes um, a major contribution, I think, in terms of um, the ways in which organizations can really kind of, I suppose, move forward, be sustainable, but also embrace change. And, and I heard there as well, Inez, from you. I mean, it, it, it's actually, it sets useful parameters for decision-making and actually determining the strategic direction to align with the purpose and align with the other requirements that you have. Uh, so so, so it, it's, it's back to your earlier point, isn't it? It, it's, it? it can actually serve as a very useful platform. It's not something that you stick on the shelf once you've ticked all the boxes, it's actually something you refer back to that's actually embedded within the organization's decision making, et cetera. What are we about? What do we need to do? Um, uh, so it, it, it's quite useful in that context. Mm -hmm. Ashley, I'm going to turn to you now. Ashley, um, I'm, I've, I've got two questions for you, okay? As, as a resident technical expert here, I've got two questions. One is a question from the audience here, and it's should all not for profits, shouldn't all not for profits also be read? Sorry, I'm going to read it, sorry. Should all not-for-profits not also be registered as a charity, particularly if they're getting public funding? Okay, um, Neil, I suppose that's, that's probably one you could talk all day about, I, I, you know, because I suppose not, the term not-for-profit probably straddles, you know, a very wide group of organisations that, you know, that don't, you know, strictly fall within the remit of, 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 of you know, the charity regulator. So, uh, you know, I suppose there was a lot, lot of thought, I suppose, given by the regulator to who would fall within the remit of a charity way back a number of years ago when, when, when the regulator's office was set up. Um, so, I, so I'm not going to give you a yes or no answer to that one okay. because I think a lot of those other organisations, I suppose, are probably also covered by other regulators and, you know, it could be housing regulator, could be um, various different departments of government or whatever where they do have to kind of conform with certain regulations and certain governance codes and, you know, universities, um, for example, are considered to be charities, but they're, you know, they're, they're outside the remit of, I suppose, some of the regulations that the charity yeah. regulator issues, but, but again, they, you know, they, they have various other um, people in the Department of Education that they report to, so look, it's, it's, it, that's, a, that's a kind of a hairy one, and it's probably a, a, a debate for another day, but there isn't really a, a yes or no or a right or wrong answer, I, I would say, to it. Well, that's that's revealing enough in itself, Ashley, that it requires more looking at the stuff. And I can actually resonate with it a little bit because uh, like Charter Counts Ireland is not a charity, but it is a not for profit mm. organization. And I don't mm. know, somewhere along the way, we probably get public funding, be it skill net funding or something for events and that. But yet there's no requirement for us to to be a charity. Yet we probably have to comply with whatever the conditions of funding are. So I, I can understand that, that, that the complexities that, that, that might exist in answering that question, which leads me to the original question I have for you, Ashley, which is in relation mm. to compliance with the charity's governance code. There are additional requirements actually for more complex charities. And from your experience, Ashley, have charities correctly interpreted whether they should be complying with only the core standards in the code? or with the additional standards that are necessary for more complex charities? Okay, Neil, that, I suppose that's an interesting one. I think initially quite a lot of charities, a number of charities that I spoke to um, had assumed, I suppose, initially when they started looking at the governance code first, that the CRA would consider them to be less complex charities. 
Uh, and, and I suppose they initially set out then with the intention of complying with the basic standards in the code and obviously not the additional standards. And I, I suppose the reason for that is that, you know, I suppose, you know, it, it could be, quite, you know, quite easy to get confused. And I know at some point in the past, you know, there was various thresholds mentioned by the regulator for small charities. I think 100,000 was mentioned at one stage or 250,000 was mentioned at a later stage in terms of income thresholds, etc. for sort of, you know, different requirements around SORP and, and, and things like that. So I suppose the, 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 the governance code is a little bit different in that it doesn't set any monetary thresholds. The regulators included a number of different indicators that you've got to consider when determining whether you're complex or non-complex. There isn't a, a hard or fast answer. I suppose you've got to consider all the indicators, see where you fit. And I suppose then, you know, I think the regulators clearly said as well that it's, it's the charity trustees themselves who are best placed, I suppose, to determine whether they're, they're complex or not. But I suppose some of the indicators the charity regulator requires you to look at in, in, in considering this is, you know, I suppose looking at your level of income and expenditure now, as I said, there's no monetary threshold there. Um, all, 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 although having said that, in one of the examples that the regulator gives um, the, the charity that they're deeming to be complex in this particular example actually only has income of 120,000, so that's not obviously a huge amount of money. Um, you know, they also require you to look at, I suppose, your asset base, what assets do you hold, do you have a lot of properties, how many employees do you have, how many volunteers do you have, what's, you know, what's the structure of the entity, you know, like, is it complex, is it straightforward, um, and how complex is, it, is its activities, I suppose, are you dealing with vulnerable people, you know, who, who are you dealing with, who, who are your beneficiaries, so there's lots of questions, you know, there isn't a, a rule that, you know, you've got to answer for and buy them, you know, a certain way, it's, it's very much, you know, kind of to stand back and have a look at the, the, the indicators and then decide. So what I would say, what I've seen, I suppose, over the last year is, you know, people initially when they looked at this probably thought, you know, to be complex, you'd have to be one of the really large multinational charities like the Trova Concern, etc. And, and obviously that's way off, you know, that's not what the regulator intended. So I think that a number of charities have actually confirmed compliance with the code on the basis that they've complied with all of the core standards in the code. And they're now, I suppose, working towards complying with the more complex standards with, with the view, I suppose, to becoming fully compliant as a more complex um, uh, charity by the time they confirm their next compliance, I suppose, October this year. So I think there's, there's a number of charities out there who may well have ticked box A, but aren't quite in box A, you know, and, and I suppose they're working towards that. A little nervous bead of sweat running down my back. Uh, Ashley, as I watch it, just end this now and run back and see, oh, have we got it right? <laughs> I understand there is complexity there. I, I have a vague recollection of some of those requirements you mentioned there uh, in terms of you know, operations overseas. And of course, many charities cannot be blamed. They will assume they're not complex by virtue of being small, which has got nothing to do actually with whether or not you're complex. So it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's something uh, mm -hmm. people will probably need to take another look at. Uh, so hopefully we haven't panicked too many people, but it's it's good to get it called out now um, that, 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 that we can take that away. Um, one of the many things actually that resonated with me from David's presentation was the call out that innovation is um, as essential in the charity sector as it is for the private sector. Now, this resonates with me for a number of reasons. Number one is clearly with Charter Counts Ireland, one of the core values in our strategy is, is, um, is innovation with ambition. That's a value that we encourage all the staff and, and people in the organization to aspire to is innovation with ambition. And also my involvement as a judge in the Good Governance Awards, the Carmichael Good Governance Awards, uh, we, we also look in, in terms of judging entries uh, from charities, we also look at who's being innovative and doing something different, whether it be gender pay gap reporting or whatever it is they're doing uh, to, to, to set themselves apart to, 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 to warrant a good governance award, if you like. If I ask each of the panelists, and, and I'll start with you, Inez, could you provide any insights to an innovative practice that you've seen either in your organization or any other charity that you're aware of, um, or not-for-profit organization? Any other, any innovative uh, activity you've seen that, that might spark the imaginations of our audience here? Well, one of the things that I looked at was a, um, an innovation tool. Um, just a very simple innovation tool to apply to whatever the thing you might want to look at is. And it, it took the approach that the first thing to do, because many organizations feel that they're already overburdened. Um, and the idea of innovating on top of that really is a very challenging thing, especially where there might be additional R&D investment to go into the organization. So sometimes the process of just auditing what they are doing and perhaps stopping something 
that is no longer um, either efficient or effective or meeting a particular purpose. That creates a space and it becomes like the first quadrant of an innovation tool that you can use that actually opens up the idea of actually saying to people, no, actually we found a bit of space where we can take something out here um, and perhaps put in some other area that we want to explore a new solution to, to go into. So I think the idea of innovation being broken down into something small and, and tangible and getting people to focus on that where they can take out some time from something else to actually put in something new can be really quite liberating as opposed to I think coming out from, uh, you know, let's all start being innovative overnight or very quickly or come up with the, the biggest idea that we ever had. That is a really challenging and daunting task. Whereas building in that much more lower level build it up from the ground more gradual and, and, and an ongoing piece where you're kind of saying let's strip out things that are no longer work for us and let's leave space for discussion and development about other ideas then we can explore them and see whether or not they're actually maybe there's three we have in the pipeline we only want to maybe take one forward um, and we've gathered up some evidence to do that so I think having innovation processes within an organization in and of themselves can be a really useful um, and a nice little tactic to build innovation in. Ines, I don't want to put you on the spot. If you don't, that's okay. But you, you don't have the name of that tool or a reference for that tool or, or something it, we can it, follow it, up It actually um, came out of an individual who was doing um, a, a master's program, a business, an MBA. Um, and uh, she shared it with her tutor, who then kind of shared it as part of the Innovation Academy in Maynooth University. That's how I would have come across it. So she just she just developed it in her own private sector practice and shared it um, as part of her, her MBA studies. And I, I just came across it then through through Maynooth University and little four quadrants, effectively, like the most simple little tool you could think of. But as I say, starting with the clear out piece. Then the kind of, you know, let's do after the audit process, look, let me look at sort of some ideas. Then the third quadrant was kind of looking at maybe doing a bit of an evidence on those ones. And then having a fourth one that just said, OK, have we picked one that we might want to take forward a little bit? Brilliant, Ines, because what you've illustrated there as well is the value add from engaging with other organisations and also the value add of diversity in the context of you engaging there with the younger cohort who may not be experienced governance heads but they have actually got something to bring to the table in terms of improving governance. So that, that's, that's brilliant. John, could I ask the same question of you? Is there anything innovative that you've come across either in the organizations you've been part of or observations of other organizations you've seen? Well, I'm going to talk about my own organization because innovation often arises in unexpected areas. Um, and it goes back to the what David and others have been saying. Um, one of the things that's really struck me uh, when I joined and even of late is staff uh, have worked together spontaneously to produce guides to difficult areas that they're been working in so as to assist others who are working in this area who don't get bogged down and one of them for example was a lovely document that was produced on the wards of court on the entire process and we deal with people who are yeah. have significant disabilities and are often involved in that process and they this document uh, which was quite technical but very straightforward broke all that down now, if you were someone who was trying to deal with that process, even within our organization by yourself, there's an enormous amount of learning involved. So for so someone to come along and say, this is what I think we should do and to do it and to produce a document of high quality um, struck me as, a, as a, a, an innovation, which is worth mentioning because it's something we often don't do. We work our way through something and we leave it, and we, when we're finished, we leave it to one side, but they didn't do that. They took the opportunity to, to take the learnings, go across the entire organization and pull together something which everybody can use. And I've seen that done again and again within the organization. And the other thing I want to say arising out of COVID was that every organization in the sector had difficulties during COVID in terms of delivering services, access and clientele. Our organization adopted pretty well technologically to that, but so, most of our clients we need to meet face to face and that proved very challenging. One of the things we did arising out of this, you would say, well, this is what you should be doing, was in addition to trying to overcome those challenges, the organization sat down and pulled together four small reports 
under different headings, outlining the learnings from that in terms of the vulnerable and the disabled, not only in, re in respect of the people we traditionally deal with in the National Advocacy Service, but also in respect of the patient advocacy service we, we should do under contract from the Department of Health, uh, which is a new organization. And that looked at what was happening in nursing homes and in the, in the uh, acute hospitals, and what was the impact on people and the vulnerable and on their rights in those kind of settings. And what struck me about that, Neil, was to do that at a time when you're already overburdened, when you're struggling to keep the show on the road, um, took a quite an amount of uh, focused and individual uh, innovation that someone had the presence in mind to actually pull together this under four different disparate headings. And there were four small reports that we launched and that actually raised issues of sig real significance in terms of people's human rights. And that to me is innovation, keeping your eye on the ball, uh, even in the midst of a crisis, don't, put, let, don't let it go to waste. There's always something that can be learned. Thank you, John. I'm just, I want to put one question, more question to Ashley, and I've got a kind of final question for you all, and I'm going to try and squeeze it in. So Ashley, I'm going to put this question to you, but if, if we could keep the answer short, it, it would be great, because, you know, everyone has done a huge amount of work to get compliant with the governance code to date, okay? And also, I don't leave non-for-profits out of this, because they're not required to comply with the charities code, but they do an awful lot of work to have good governance standards within their organisations as well. There's a process in there, Ashley. Uh, you've, you've, you've ticked the boxes, you're now compliant. What is it or what is it that organizations can be doing on an ongoing basis to ensure that they're keeping up to date and that they're, they're keeping compliant uh, within their organizations? Uh, I mean, I think, I think there's lots of things, um, Neil. I mean, there's, I suppose, just to take on maybe two, two, two items. One in relation to conflicts of interest, I suppose that's one aspect of the code that gets a lot of attention. Um, most charities have some sort of process in place around conflicts of interest, but I think when you look, you know, in depth at, at those processes, there's probably lots of improvement that you could do or make around those. The other area, um, and I suppose this goes back to the innovation point that you had a minute ago as well, um, in relation to things like board papers, you know, I know lots and lots of charities that have had the same format of board papers, you know, going back donkey's years, you might have had a succession of CEOs and finance directors in that period, but nobody has actually taken the time to stand back and to, uh, to really think and to apply some innovation um, to, to the format of the board papers to ensure, I suppose, that the information the trustees are getting gives them the relevant facts to make the informed decisions or whatever. And I suppose that's, that's one of the core, core standards in the code as well. Um, and sorry, Neil, there was something else as well, was there, you wanted to... No, that's that's good. Just what can people do yeah. on an ongoing basis uh, to make sure the compliance does because the, the work doesn't end just when you've ticked the boxes and mm. and, 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 and you're compliant to the code. So no, I mean, it needs to constantly evolve. I suppose it's, it, the code is not intended to stand still. It is intended that you will review it every year and that you will, you know, think about where you can improve. Yeah, perfect. And folks, I'm going to squeeze this question and apologies. I feel like Brian Dobson on Morning Ireland or something. And I'm going to give you each 30 seconds to give me a one liner. So apologies for this. But I, I can't let the moment pass because uh, the final question, I think, is important. And, and, and we're, we're probably all feeling it out there, especially in the charity not for profit sector. But it's, it's on the back of an article I recently wrote for Charter Accountants Ireland. And it was on the Ukraine crisis and the ethical considerations for accountants. And, you know, it's clearly a despicable, tragic breach of peace that's going on and causing untold suffering. And loss of life as we know um, but as people and organizations are looking to help the millions of ukrainians that are displaced by the invasion they're either donating directly or they're running fundraiser events and as this is happening there are sadly opportunities for fraud and illegal fundraising that needs to be appropriately risk management managed and regulated would the panel have anything to add in the context of charitable activity that's taking place at the moment across the country support this humanitarian crisis? Is there anything you would call out to people to be aware of? I think the, just a number, there's like a number of very high profile, well-regulated organizations who put themselves forward to say that they can take uh, donations of any, of any sort or the type that's really needed at this critical time. And I would just really follow their advice because they are saying it from, uh, a very informed position, both nationally and internationally. So I would really try and keep a connection specifically with those organizations who have a role in this space. Thank you, Inez. John? I'd agree with Inez entirely. Um, I've actually dealt with a number of inquiries about uh, 
sending uh, aid to Ukraine in the back of a trailer. And my response was go to established charities that are doing that job day in, day out, the Red Cross, there's loads of others. Um, they know how to do this. They know how to get the, the aid there. And I said to people, you know, the best aid you can often give someone in those situations is a prepaid card with cash in it because people know what they need, you know, and the best place to do that is to work with established charities that know what are the needs on the ground. You don't need to send sleeping bags to Ukraine that, you know, they can get them in Poland next door for a fraction of the price. Be practical. Go to established bodies that know how to do it. Final comment to Ashley. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I've had a number of inquiries actually in the last few days from organisations trying to set up charities, I suppose, to assist in relation to Ukraine. And my overriding advice to them all has been give to an existing um, charity rather than go down that road. Well, listen, thank you very much to my panel, Inez Bailey, John Roycroft and Ashley Fitzgerald. Very grateful and thank you for joining us today. I would now like to introduce Teresa Campbell, who's member of Council for Chartered Accountants Ireland. She's also chair of the Ethics and Governance Committee, member of our members board and members in practice committee, all while managing her day job as director of PKF FPM Accountants Limited, an all Ireland accountancy and business advice practice. So Teresa, over to you to close out the session and thank you once again to our panel and our previous speaker, David Brady. Thank, thank you, Neil, and it's great to be here um, this afternoon. I'm very conscious of time, so if you just give me, afford me a, a couple of minutes. Um, and before we close, I would like to share just a few thoughts on behalf of Chartered Accountants Ireland Ethics and Governance Committee. And we were delighted to collaborate with the Institute's charity and not-for-profit special interest group to bring you this event this morning. And I suppose, as many of us will be aware, one of the strategic priorities of Chartered Accountants Ireland is to be an effective and leading voice for members by being consulted with and influential on key issues affecting our profession and the wider economy. And we're determined and proud to use this voice to support the charity and not-for-profit sector. And I think as we've heard this morning, um, Chartered Accountants Ireland has strong affiliations with the charity and not-for-profit sector. For starters, as many of us will be aware, and as Neil mentioned, I think today, that the Institute is a non-profit organization and it operates a charity of its own CA support, um, which is a fantastic, fantastic work that they do and many staff are actually involved in charitable activities. We also support and encourage others to get involved in uh, the Carmichael Good Governance Award for the charity and non-profit sector, which again, many of us will be aware of. And the Institute often collaborates with other bodies and events and other initiatives that support the sector. And indeed, our own district societies, along with um, Charity Accountants Ireland, continue to run events on relevant issues and updates for the sector. And I suppose of importance also is that the Institute liaises with various regulators and standard setters through official consultations and other engagements to ensure that our voice is heard and to lend our expertise to the development of effective regulations, governance and accounting standards. So with over 30,000 members, and many of us are indeed involved in the charity and non-profit sector in some, compa some capacity, many of, many of us on the webinar this morning, um, either working directly in the sector volunteering, holding trustee and other non-executive positions, or indeed providing professional services to the sector. Um, so indeed that makes, I suppose, this webinar also very relevant to a lot of our members. So thank you very much, David, our guest speaker, David Brady, for sharing your expertise and insight. I certainly find the charity board maturity model that you talked about very thought provoking, and certainly in some of the voluntary positions that I hold, I, I'd be um, discussing that further. Thank you also to our panellists, Inez Bailey, John Roycroft and Ashley Fitzgerald. And thank you, Neil, as always, for chairing such an interesting discussion this morning. I certainly took a lot away from the insights and practical experiences shared by yourself and the panellists. And I suppose one key takeaway is that while compliance with the governance code is essential, there's certainly a lot more required to achieve effective governance. And the panellists have provided us all, I think, here today with much food for thought on that. And lastly, I think thank you to everybody here who has attended in good numbers this morning. Um, and I hope certainly that you have taken some uh, insights into uh, what was presented here today. And I suppose it's your support and participation that makes events like this worthwhile. We hope there was at least one thing that you got from today's event that will make a difference to you. So thank you all and goodbye and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>